So we'll talk about um, people and Rhino, and, and what I'm trying to do here is I'm actually trying to cover two different chapters uh, from the book. One chapter is about uh, the history of HIP going as far back as possible in terms of human land use. Uh, the other chapter is about um, uh, grassland heterogeneity and drivers of grassland heterogeneity. So I'm, I'm trying to cover both chapters, so there will not be a lot of detail in this in this talk. I'm sure I miss a lot of detail, but there's a lot more detail in the in the chapter. One of the key features of, of HRP, I think, is that it has an, an enormous uh, grassland heterogeneity, and it's mostly driven by these um, grazing lawns, which you see here as these very short patches, uh, consisting of um, of I'll have that here, of a uni unique community of grazing tolerant grass species, and they also often are uh, forming nutrient hotspots. So they often have very high concentrations of, of, of nitrogen, phosphorus, and things like sodium and potassium. This is just to show you that um, I think HIP is quite unique, especially in terms of this uh, short grass, um, tall grass heterogeneity. And I've done some work in both in Kruger National Park and a lot more work in, in HIP. And this is just, each, each point uh, represents a transect of, a, of a several, several kilometers in length. So it's a pretty um, large area that each, each point uh, reflects. And then it's the proportion uh, of short grass, or actually proportion of grazing lawn, uh, on that transect. So the proportion of, of uh, a few kilometers covered by grazing lawn. And you see then on the left, the Kruger National Park, and on the right, uh, HIP. Uh, just to show you that HIP actually has much higher um, covers of grazing lawn than, for example, Kruger National Park. And uh, you see the averages. Uh, down there, but in HAP it goes from between zero and, and 30 to 35 percent of a transact, um, and in Kruger National Park it's mostly be below five, five to ten percent, so uh, at most. So um, the work on grazing lawns started quite uh, quite some time ago, and I think Norman Owen Smith was um, was the key person that that started a lot of that work in in, in, in Flozy Park, and actually that goes back to what what Lisa has been talking about. Uh, during the 50s and 60s, one of the major concerns was uh, overgrazing in the park, so uh, degraded felt basically. Um, and um, so a lot of these great what we nowadays would call a grazing lawn were basically considered as uh, as strongly uh, degraded grasslands. So it's something that you would not want to have in your park, basically. So that's the reason that people started culling uh, animals like warthog, uh, wildebeest, um, and not white rhino, of course, because that was a, a conservation concern. Uh, but they started culling these short grass grazers to try to uh, have the, the grassland, uh, to give the, the grassland an opportunity to, um, to recover. Um, but then Norman came in with his PhD, and he started showing that, that these grazing lawns actually seem to be quite a specific grassland community, that um, is not necessarily reflecting overgrazed uh, felt, but can actually be, be very important for certain species, including white rhino. And he also showed that white rhino likely are an important driver of creating these lawns and also um, maintaining these lawns. Uh, later on, he wrote this book, uh, this very famous book, obviously, Mega Herbivores from 1988, based on his PhD. Uh, much more recently, um, people have continued studying uh, the effect of white rhino on grazing on cover. This is a study by, by uh, Matt Waldrum together with, uh, with William Bond. And they used uh, the white rhino removal program in HIP. Uh, so they compared areas where white rhino were being removed with areas where they were not uh, being removed. So in, uh, in black, you see the control areas. So that's the areas where the rhino were not removed. And then the gray bars are the, the rhino removal areas. And they basically show on the y-axis, it's the percentage of short cross slash grazing lawn. Um, and they show that uh, the proportion of short cross in, in, in white rhino removal areas uh, is, is much, much lower. And this is actually only, uh, I think, maximum a year after the removal. I think it's actually even shorter, a couple of months, or so maybe six months following the removal. And you can also see on the left is the Gricluva section, which is much more mesic, much, more, much higher rainfall. Than, uh, than the section on the right, Umphalosi. And you can see that the effect of white rhino is much stronger in the red areas, which obviously makes sense, because under high rainfall conditions, you might need a much more intense grazing pressure to uh, maintain your short grass areas. So grazing lawns have been studied uh, since, since Norman started studying them quite extensively in the park. And a lot of interesting studies have been done. 
uh, also looking at the functional importance of grazing lands, not just the functional importance for herbivores like white hino, warthog, wildebeest, etc., but also for other uh, taxonomic groups. So there are studies done on, on birds, grasshoppers, and spiders, and all of them seem to indicate that these grazing lands are, are, um, um, are used by a certain community of species. For example, these three uh, bird species at the bottom seem to be grazing lawn specialists. <coughs> The functional importance of grazing lawns also goes beyond uh, sort of more biodiversity uh, type um, questions. Uh, and this is also, I guess, a, in a way, a very obvious effect of grazing lawns. Grazing lawns, because they are so short, uh, are very effective uh, fire breaks. So they stop fire going through your grassland. So grazing lawns actually um, can strongly reduce fire extent and fire frequency. And this is again based from the from, uh, on the work from Matt Waldrum showing the same uh, black bars where, where right rhino were still present and the gray bars where they have been removed. And basically on the left you show, we see that um, the, the extent of your burns increases when you remove white rhino. And on the right, it's the measure of heterogeneity. Basically, if it increases, it means that your fire becomes more homogeneous uh, and less, pet less patchy. So that would also make sense if you have patches of grazing lawns scattered around in your grassland, it breaks up the fire. Lastly, grazing lawns seem to be very effective in terms of uh, stopping woody recruitment. So uh, woody species have a hard time of recruit, uh, to recruit inside the grazing lawn. This is just a, a picture, and I, actually I, I think we still lack very good data uh, that shows this. But you see it if you drive around the park. Uh, your woody species will be recru recruiting in your tall grassland or uh, underneath uh, trees, and not uh, that much on grazing lawns. So I think if you talk, of, talk about uh, bush encroachment, uh, grazing lawns play a cent central role in that discussion. So the conclusion halfway, I would say, is grazing lawns seem to play a central role in the functioning of HRP's uh, savanna systems. Uh, rhino seems to be a major driver of grazing lawn development and maintenance, specifically in music savanna. And I'm drawing these con conclusions based on the research that has been done in HRP. Uh, but there may be at least one other very important reason for the abundance of lawns in HRP. Cleo. Prehistoric farming practices in HRP. So now we sort of change the scene. <laughs> HRP has been inhabited, and that's, uh, that's sort of the second chapter, the other chapter in the book, has been inhabited for at least 1500 years. Um, the oldest findings are actually going back to the 17th century in terms of uh, Iron Age sites. Um, and from the 11th century, um, it has been um, there are actually quite a lot of findings in terms of settle settlements and also iron smelting sites across the whole of HRP. And a lot of good work actually has been done on this in the 70s and the 80s, uh, mostly by Martin Hall and by Jim Feely, um, um, the two, the two uh, archeolo archaeologists. Um, this is just to show you um, an overview of some of the data that's available on, on archaeological findings in, uh, in HRP. Uh, all the dots represent some kind of archaeological finding. Uh, the big red dots are um, clear signs of, of kraal uh, sites. So they, they used to be there used to be a kraal on, on that uh, location. And this is actually just a minimum count because they have not covered the whole park uh, as intensively as far as I know. So I, as, I, as I mentioned, this, this, uh, this kraal sites, so this is how, uh, how one would look like. Um, so basically, um, um, an area where, where, where livestock is kept overnight. So you get these bare, um, these, these circles of bare ground uh, with lots of input of, of dung and urine. And there's a lot of work uh, from elsewhere in Africa uh, which has studied the effects of abandoned homesteads. So what happens if people, as soon as people abandon the kraal or the homestead or the boma as they are being called in, in East Africa. <laughs> Uh, some of that work is also from South Africa, for example, in the Niels Fly uh, Reserve. Uh, a lot of work in Kenya, by, especially by Truman Young. Um, and they show that uh, after these coral sites are being abandoned, they are being uh, colonized, or uh, re I guess colonized, yeah, by a specific community of palatable lawn grass species. And following that colonization, they are actually being maintained by wild herbivores for at least several decades, uh, potentially even centuries. And um, this is probably because of elevated soil and plant nutrient levels, resulting from this uh, decadal long input of nutrients through, through dung and, and, and urine. 
But also, uh, what's often mentioned is that they are uh, open glades, so they actually provide an habitat with very low, relatively low predation risk because of their openness. So it might be a combination of these two things. So what um, Martin Hall uh, did when he was working in HFP in the 70s is he actually um, uh, traced back uh, several of those abandoned uh, call sites. Um, so he described 28 abandoned homesteads, and he showed that 24 of those 28 were actually characterized by, by uh, mostly Eurochloa mozambicensis, but also some of them Digitary longiflora. And they were very intensely used by, um, by Rhino. And actually, um, Jim Feely told me this, this, in a way, quite interesting story. He did, he did a study on white rhino. Jim Feely used to work in the park and also in the, in the 60s. And he asked um, his field rangers, can you please um, show me the way to, to, uh, to an area which, is, uh, which white rhino, uh, like, like which white rhino prefers? So, um, so they took him every time to a perfect place, like, and then he, after a couple of years, he asked them about uh, why did you take me to these places? And then the answer was, uh, we actually thought you want, wanted us to take you to uh, abandoned homesteads. So they actually already made that connection between um, abandoned homesteads and, and areas that are preferred by white rhino. And this is just a graph showing you. Um, uh, you would like this, right? This is this area only four here at the bottom, so a long grass species. This is the set of the archaeological findings, so where you would find the grinding stones and the pottery. And this, this goes uh, away from the, from the, into the abandoned home set. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So you basically you see that the digitaria is limited to the center of the abandoned homestead. And then if you go away, you see uh, tall grass species like Tamida uh, actually take over. Uh, on, the, on the edge of the, uh, the abandoned homesteads. Um, and these homesteads were likely abandoned about 100 years before um, these measurements were done. So that's a pretty long time. So then we also have some more recent evidence from, or some evidence for more, for more recent human impact. I think as Lisa has been uh, talking about just now, is that the central uh, corridor section um, has been inhabited by people until uh, at least the 1940s. Um, and what we did with some students is we, we've asked uh, people to identify uh, former homesteads to us in, in the central uh, corridor area. So we, had, we identified uh, nine former homesteads from the 1940s, so then we talk about 60 years ago. And we, um, so these are the nine, these nine homesteads. Um, then we combined that data with another data set that we had on grazing lawn cover from transects. These are actually the, the game centers transacts that I worked, uh, worked that Lisa talked about. Um, what we did on these transacts, we measured grazing lawn cover every five meters. So we could actually link uh, the distance. Thank you. Yeah. So we, what we did is we divided these transacts in smaller parts, and we, we, um, we related uh, the proportion of lawn on a, on a, on a transact to the distance uh, to the, the nearest BOMA site. And we found a pretty clear relationship that the closer you are to a former BOMA site, uh, the higher proportion of grazing lawns you will find on the transect. So th this is sort of another uh, preliminary piece of evidence that, that these former homesteads um, might be one of the drivers of grazing lawn cover in HIP. So again, sort of an intermediate or a mid and halfway conclusion, um, a combination of former human land use and white rhino uh, might be uh, uh, important drivers of HRP's uh, grassland heterogeneity. Then if we talk about conservation management, uh, how is this all uh, relevant for the current situation? Well, um, I started working in the park in about 2001, I think. Um, and then um, a few years later, I, 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 as I said, I walked all these transacts and I mapped grazing lawn cover on all, on all these transacts. Then we found that 14% of the park was, uh, on average, 14% of the park was covered by grazing lawns, varying between 0 and 30%. We, re we actually rewalked these transacts in 2010, and you see a quite a, a dramatic decline in grazing lawn cover over these uh, six years. So from 14% on average to 4.5% 4, 4 on average. Uh, and remember that I talked about the functional significance of these grazing lawns for a whole range of reasons. Um, this is just the transacts showing um, that there was a lot of spatial variation in, in the decline. So some areas 
have declined much faster, the grazing on cover has declined much faster than in other areas. Um, so that, of course, brings up a lot of questions. So what are the reasons for these declines in rules? Might there be effects of a white rhino removal program if, it has, if grazing laws are, are created by white rhino? If these legacy effects of former human land use are important, might we be seeing a disappearing legacy effect of former human, former human land use? Um, something that Lisa hasn't really talked about is that her PSD, actually, uh, the, the core of her PSD is looking at the effects of predation risk uh, from increasing carnivore populations. And she's also looking at the behavioral responses of prey um, to, um, to predation risk and how does predation risk change uh, habitat selection of, of herbivores. So one of the things that obviously has been happening in HRP is an encroachment of, of uh, woody shrubs, which would increase your predation risk and might actually have caused some of these species to, um, to focus less on some of the grazing ones. Um, I think it's actually a very complicated business. So that's why I'm very happy to have Lisa as a PhD student. She can look into this. <laughs> so this is one of the chapters that Lisa will be looking into. So she will be combining um, um, white rhino, data on white rhino removal, um, data on former human land use, but also data on, uh, thank you, on, on predation risk, predation pressure. Um, so I hope to be seeing that chapter in about a year's time. The interesting thing as well is that the, that the park, as I understand, is moving into a new rhino management plan, and grazing lawns are mentioned there as an important indicator of um, when and where you should remove uh, uh, white rhino. And I think um, this, the kind of things that I've been talking about, for me at least, seem to be highly relevant uh, to, look, to be able to sort of implement these, uh, these kinds of, 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 uh, of measures. Then I will have to uh, finish with this. <laughs> because one of my other PhD students that I've, that I've co-supervised, Cleo Gosling, will talk about termites later and grazing lawns. <laughs> so there are obviously other very important drivers of, of grazing lawn uh, presence as well. Termites is definitely one of them, but also uh, the role of fire. Uh, and Sally Archibald has done a lot of nice work on the role of fire, and I'm hoping she will talk about some of that stuff later. So, um, yeah, thank you.